Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to, as more and more people are joining us, I'm going to give them a, another couple seconds to get in before we go ahead and get started. All right, in the interest of time, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Before the session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium, OESS, strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you are taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desires for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting the differences in opinions and circumstances to create a stronger collaborative environment and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. David, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you everybody for joining me today. Um, I hope everybody's um, been enjoying the conference so far. I know that I have. And um, I'm really delighted to be here today and talk to you about my presentation, uh, which is um, driving OER adoption as a key part of student advocacy and what my sort of reflection upon that is. Um, I'm a first year librarian in the fellows program at NC State. And I know that many of you sort of might be un unfamiliar perhaps with the fellows program. So I just want to sort of very quickly touch upon what that actually means and why, you know, a fellow has been chosen to kind of um, sort of lead um, a project like what I'm um, about to tell you. F fellows are a cohort. I'm one of four. Um, we're newly qualified librarians who the, the libraries employs into what's typically a two-year program. And we're each hired to lead, you know, like a specific initiative, which is normally something that's of strategic importance to the libraries. Um, we wear a few different hats. So we spend like 50% of our time working on said initiative. And the other 50 working in a in a home department doing sort of sort of every day like department, departmental work. The idea really is around you know, uh, rapid career advancement by exposing fellows to just different experiences at the academic library. So for me, for the first two years, I worked in the IT department half the time doing the everyday like departmental stuff. And in the other half, I worked on my initiative, which is I'm about to sort of talk to you more about. It, um, across many different departments. So my initiative was um, titled Student Advocacy, and the long and short of that is um, for myself to lead this project, which attempts to place the libraries like kind of at the heart of campus efforts to increase student success measures, um, particularly supporting students that are identified as statistically at risk sometimes terms, you know, vulnerable students um, who are most sort of at risk of perhaps taking either longer to complete their studies um, or even sort of, you know, worse, dropping out altogether. So I was asked to sort of figure out strategies to help reduce the financial burden of higher ed and figure out ways in what the libraries could do to, su you know, support our students get through college as quickly as possible and with as little debt as possible. Um, and my project also encompassed this idea of access and, and equity and everything that goes into that. What can we do as the libraries to get our students better, more equitable access to textbooks as well as the technologies that they need to get through school? So um, thinking about like those types of ideas, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you now about um, some of the issues which underpin some of the work that I've tried to do. Um, when we, you know, when we speak of higher ed, we, sh we shouldn't forget the financial climate that our students are, are signing up to. Within the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, the cost of attending school just continues to rise quicker and quicker and quicker than nearly anything else. And certainly, you know, at the state level, this is against the backdrop of state governments increasingly um, spending less, perhaps, on higher ed than they had done in the past. Um, so the burden of cost is therefore sort of placed on the student increasingly or the parents or the guardian. 
At NC State specifically, the total cost of attendance, the, the sticker price for undergrad students, which includes things like tuition, meals, transportation, books and supplies and personal expenses, things like that. That stands at around $25,000 for in-state students and not far off double that for out-of-state. Uh, while tuition at NC State is very competitive in comparison to other four-year publics, what these numbers don't tell you is that there are an increase of about 33% over the last 10 years for undergraduate in-state and about 40% for out-of-state students. So the increase in the cost of higher ed has just resulted in this like noticeable increase in the burden of financial aid on, on those who choose to attend college. About 70% of our students rely upon some form of financial assistance, whether that's scholarships or loans or otherwise. About 43% take out loans in order to attend college and sort of within that number, about 36% um, work either on campus or off and about 70% are using at least some of their own money to help with college expenses. So for many of that number, they're looking at you know, substantial debts for the next 20, 25 years, maybe longer. And certainly at times where you know, in the past, people have traditionally long moved on from higher ed and you know, looking to start families, um, buy, buy, buy houses, start businesses, travel, all that sort of thing. Um, so due to the, you know, the high amount of debt that you can rack up from college, many students are then sort of confronted with this choice about whether, the, you know, whether it's worth going to college in the first place, given the, the debt they'll be facing for the next 20, 25 years. You know, is attending a four-year public worth it? And um, facing those loan repayments afterwards. You know, then you throw in the economic hardship called the pandemic, such as job losses, um, certainly in NC State, a lot of our student jobs were just eliminated after March 2020. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, about 36% of students work during their time at college. And suddenly it can seem like this giant sort of financial hurdle that's ahead of you. According to the North Carolina Justice Center, um, a typical family of four must earn a minimum of about $50,000 a year in order to afford the basics, housing, food, um, childcare, healthcare, transportation, taxes, and all that. But then you look at the, the data from our intake, this is from our fall 2020 intake, and about 15% of our students come from households that make $50,000 or less a year. So you can see that that's a, a large number of them that arrive at NC State statistically at risk either taking longer to complete their degree or dropping out full stop because an unforeseen financial hardship such as a medical cost, um, a problem with transportation or textbook costs can have a more devastating effect on that particular population than students from wealthier families. And it's likewise students that identify as first generation um, first generation students have just as much aptitude, if not more, than any other category of student, but they don't always enjoy the same type of this cultural currency that students with at least one parent who attended college sort of can enjoy. And statistically, they're about four times more likely to drop out in comparison to a student who's, who at least one parent had attended college. So to many students, the, the true cost of college on a personal level can come later into their academic careers. We have a lot of um, students at our school and across many of the other schools in the nation that are facing sort of personal crisis during their time here, with things such as food and housing insecurity. Two professors at NC State um, late last year um, held a survey and sent to about 7,500 students. And I think they got about 1,500 responses and it, the survey um, specifically looked at homelessness, food and housing insecurity as a result of the pandemic. And about 23% of the respondees responded that they faced some form of food insecurity within a 30 day period. And about 15% experienced housing insecurity within that time period. And again, our studies you know, typically show us that our more vulnerable student populations 
are just more susceptible to these types of situations. So though COVID-19 has had a heavy impact on the numbers applying to college, um, we still continue to see large numbers of students applying to enroll every semester. In the fall of last year, 2020, we had 31,000 applicants. And the main reason why students will apply is future prosperity. Um, a study in Georgetown showed that 65% of American jobs require some form of education post high school, about 35% require a bachelor's degree. So without e either of those, your chances of getting a job in, in our economy are slim. And on average, a person with a college degree will earn 32,000 more per year than somebody without. So for many students, it's a no brainer. They, they have to come to college um, in order to, to succeed in, in life, you know. That's not always necessarily true, but that's certainly a mindset for some of them. So they take out um, loans and they essentially gamble that the, the, the costs of attending college will sort of pay off in the longer term. And they bank on their degree sort of paying off down that road. So to bring this back to the initiative, you know, I've, I've touched upon some of the issues that are outside of the library scope to, to a large extent, but there's a special category of these like invisible costs that the libraries and people within the libraries can affect and that's books and supplies predating my initiative our libraries have been very active you know in this within this sector of the universities we've had a, a long-term partnership with the bookstore to offer short-term lending to students we've had a, a very robust short-term technology lending program we've just led campus efforts to incorporate open education into campus curriculum through things like um, our alt textbook project and our work around scholarly communications um, and of course you know granted it's not books and supplies is not the highest cost leading to these affordability issues but it's still a significant outlay for many students and it is the one cost that we as librarians can influence and work with faculty to impact upon you know what's more there's good data that's out there to show that books and supplies has a special impact upon the academic success of our students. Um, for instance, this is the results of a study down in Florida in I think 2018 um, that looked at what, you know, what is the impact of textbook costs on students in higher ed institutions down there. And they found you know, a range of different issues that the cost of textbooks had. Um, Two thirds reported not purchasing the textbook because of the cost. But there are also, you know, large percentages that reported dropping courses altogether, withdrawing from courses, not enrolling in courses in the first instance, because of the cost of the course materials that were there. In a local sense, um, a quick sort of analysis of the book list information that we have from our own bookstore showed that in fall of last year, we had about 160 courses um, that listed a textbook that cost $200 or more. There's not, there's not sections, um, those are individual courses. So to put that into some perspective, you know, for a $200 um, uh, textbook, it would you know, take a student 28 hours minimum wage work to be able to afford that. Um, and that sort of price point kind of play, you know, for a lot of students, it places the textbook sort of out of reach. So a lot of students will, you know, choose to forego the textbook sort of altogether, all therefore um, having, a, you know, a negative impact upon their, the chances perhaps of their academic success in some instances. Um, and OER as well, one, you know, one of the attractive things is that there is an equity strategy behind OER, um, which goes to the heart of student success, you know, for instance, OER with, with OER, all students can have day one access. And we've seen that, you know, in many studies that looks at, you know, well, how did well do students in courses using OER, how do they fare in comparison to courses where they're, you know, they're not using OER, they're using more traditional course materials. And they find, you know, um, sort of a, a meta study found that, that looked specifically at this, found that OER works sort of 
for all in terms of um, grades and, and achievement, but it particularly works for students historically underrepresented by higher ed. You know, it be affected in, in a positive sense, um, students of color, students who receive financial federal aid, students who enroll part-time um, with sort of, you know, a really big um, noticeable increase there. So with that in mind, at the sort of the onset of my initiative, I decided to sort of place driving OER awareness and adoption as kind of like, you know, that, at the forefront of my strategy to tackle student affordability and equity. I began my position just as the, the university entered into um, an institutional partnership with OpenStax. The libraries combined with Delta, our instructional technologists, and um, the campus bookstore on this endeavor. For those who are sort of unfamiliar with the, this institutional partnership, uh, OpenStax, they provide um, their partners like us with um, coaching, like strategic planning, trading, and the goal is to support um, the efforts in driving OER adoption across college campuses. So within that, we made three um, different grants available through the Open Textbook Grants. Um, review a textbook and post it on the Open Textbook Library for others to see. Adopt a textbook um, and a much larger grant for a, a, a department to adopt. So five faculty members across three different courses. And I'm pleased to say that things have gone really well. Um, we're sort of two years in, and we've seen um, textbook savings of about $600,000, um, which has impacted about 9,300 students. And we've worked with uh, 25 faculty members across 32 different courses. And in the semester sort of just gone, in, in the spring semester, that's when we had our highest number of, of adoptions. So there's some momentum behind these efforts. In terms of um, strategies, sort of what's worked well, um, perhaps one of the most effective ones has been direct tactics. So that essentially looks like um, analyzing the bookstore's uh, textbook list, identifying courses, uh, particularly those which are sort of high enrollment intro level courses where we know that there's good availability of OER available and cold contacting those faculty members and trying to arrange a meeting with them. Um, prior to the pandemic, I would attend these meetings with a physical copy of, of an, a, an OER book that I thought might be sort of useful for them to review and I'll leave it with them to look at. Um, and when I talk to them, I don't just talk about the affordability aspects of OER because in some ways that's sort of underselling it. Affordability is really important, but for many faculty, that alone is not the deciding factor. Um, so I talk to them about things like the freedom of the open license, the opportunities it provides to customize um, their content and really just allow them the freedom to teach their course the way that they want to. Alongside, well, along with these meetings, we've done things like workshops, um, presentations to departments, things like that. And we've also been really deliberate in not having one person alone support OER adoption. You know, we don't have an OER librarian on campus. So we have on our alt textbook committee, for instance, we have a range of different skill sets available from subject librarians to instructors to copy, you know, copyright experts and things like that. We've also tried to make open more accessible. So um, in the, the previous, in the spring uh, 2021, fall 2020, we had open cafes every week. So these were weekly drop-ins where faculty members and librarians could drop in and just listen to others having conversations around different topics of open education and sort of build a community that way. Um, we received buy-in, like strong buy-in, from you know, the upper echelons of our campus, from you know, the, um, the provost's office downwards, the deans, our director of libraries has been um, great in sort of advocating our calls as well. Um, we had a campus visit by OpenStax where they um, had meetings sort of around campus, um, the provost's office again, student government, um, 
individual faculty uh, well, fac groups of faculty and things like that that was very helpful um and sort of you know re obviously redesigning a course asks a lot of faculty members so we've been mindful to make sure that we have um small financial incentives to reward that work as well although it's while that you know is is welcomed it's not all you know it's not as much of a carrot as first realized and we've learned that it's really around about the support and the expertise that comes with adoption more so than the financial incentive which was interesting um, but we have faced challenges along the way um, so obviously you know faculty um, COVID-19 impacted heavily upon our efforts because for, you know many faculty were now having to adjust to teaching online for the first time in many cases personal demands um, as well at home so um, the for many sort of the idea of redesigning a course um, it wasn't necessarily the right moment in the spring and, and the summer of last year so we found it more sort of weighted towards um, you know the spring of 2021 this summer as well now that maybe time has sort of opened up a bit for one or two textbook sellers are still active <laughs> They're still um, they're still contacting faculty, of course, and trying to arrange much like ourselves and trying to arrange meetings and things like that. So we have to be competitive with them. Awareness is growing, still some way to go around OER. The, the scale of use across campus is still a little bit unknown because we have about 75 percent that report their course materials to the bookstore. So there's a 25 percent that we're not sure about what they're doing. One of the ways in which we tackled it was by putting up a um, like a pop up sort of a, a whiteboard in the libraries in the most in the busiest spots and asking students to say thank you to faculty that are using OER. And through that, we actually found faculty members that were completely unknown to us using OER. Um, and through some sort of outreach efforts, we were connected to other faculty members interested in doing likewise, and that actually led to some adoptions. There's also a few things too that we have to bear in mind. Some faculty don't have the ability to choose their textbook. Um, some don't have the ability not to have a textbook. We also had inclusive access on campus, um, which presents options, which doesn't ask for faculty time and can speak to the affordability factor. Uh, we've tried sort of um, textbook gifting, through sort of develop, development efforts, but we have, um, while it's possible, we have to sort of tread carefully there. And we worked very carefully with the Office of Financial Aid because um, if you don't, then you're in danger perhaps of having a, an impact on a financial aid package. So we've had to work very closely with financial aid on that. David, and I know that I'm sort of, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, in the interest of time, I want to give people the chance to ask you questions if they have any. Um, and sure. then we want to make sure we can end on time to get them to their next session. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A box. And as I'm waiting for those to come in, continue. Thank you. I'll just... Um... Just wanted to sort of rattle through a few things that I've done to supplement my OER work. So I'm, I'm an instructor in the Open Pedagogy Incubator, which is I'm aware of this. Um, it's a multi-semester program that kind of incentivizes faculty to go beyond the step of adopting OER and actually um, use sort of open enabled practices into their courses. So we're on our second cohort of that. Um, I've worked with colleagues in access services to implement um, longer term laptop lending. This was pre pandemic, which was very timely um, otherwise. Um, so this program supports students specifically who find themselves just in diff difficult financial circumstances um, and need, you know, need a laptop or don't have a laptop that necessarily um, will do what they're trying to do justice in terms of, you know, some of the, like, the software that they have to use for their courses. So we have that available, that's, on, that's ongoing. We found during the pandemic that a large number of our students, about 40% of our first year students reported problems with their internet connectivity. So we worked with T-Mobile and Verizon 
to provide them um, Wi-Fi, like mobile hotspots. They can be checked out for 30 days at a time. We have about 40 of those available. We've got one question that has come in. I want to yeah. make sure we can answer that. So how receptive were faculty you contacted directly to OER? Uh, it, was, it, it was a mixed bag, in, in all honesty. Um, certainly, I think sort of post-pandemic, I found that there was more interest in some of the things that we were we were talking about. Um, but it was, in, in some cases, a kind of, I'm really, really interested in finding out more and potentially doing this. But now is not the now is not the best time, and and we found in sort of as we went into 2021 that faculty were sort of more willing to have those conversations. And there was just further interest in in um, in our messaging. All right. Well, it looks like we are about out of time. So I want to thank you, David, for your presentation. It was very informative. It's nice to see what other universities are doing um, and inspire us to go and do those things at our institutions as well. Um, and I'm sure you will be available you know, offline for questions or anything that the rest of the attendees might have for you. Um, and at that note, we will go ahead and end the webinar and let everyone get to their next session. Thank you.